Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. This is Hannah. This is Bailey. Oh, oh wait, wait, for <laughs> That's Butters. <laughs> this is Butters. Yeah. Welcome to the Motocross Vault. <laughs> Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. I'm Tony Blazer and what this video is going to cover is the second installment of my history of the Honda CR250. Part 1 covered the history of the CR from its inception in 1973 uh, through the end of the 80s and this part 2 is going to cover the 1990s and 2007 when it was finally retired. Tear shed there. Uh, Honda really had one of the most influential machines ever when it introduced the CR250M in 1973 and it continued to be one of the most popular machines through that time period up until the end of the first video at the end of the 80s. There were some up and down years there. Uh, they weren't always the best machines, but certainly they were always very popular machines. And Honda's always had, uh, even though they weren't the best bikes always, they've always had kind of a really uh, soft spot in a lot of people's hearts. So this is a real popular machine in spite of its somewhat woeful suspension at times. Uh, now this one's going to cover the 90s, probably one of the best eras for the CR. They were on a, quite a roll there, starting in the mid-80s up until the mid-90s. Uh, they had won every Supercross title, I think, from 1987 Ward 1, so 88 through 96. I think they won every Supercross title in a row. So even though the riders changed, the CR250 kept winning. And really, it wasn't until they went to the aluminum frame in 1997 that really kind of things got derailed for Honda. And in the 2000s, you know, they had Ricky Carmichael. When he came on board, they were back to their winning ways. And uh, really, the CR was an excellent machine. Again, not always the best machine, but certainly one of the most popular and uh, really an iconic machine. So this one, again, is going to cover the 2000s and the 90s. One of my favorite years for Honda. Favorite years for motocross, really. I'm a kid of the 80s and 90s, so I love this era. These are the CRs I loved. I had famously had a 1990, well, not famously. Famously, in my mind, <laughs> I had a 1990 CR. I loved it. I had a 96. I've had a few of them over the years. And um, me, personally, I always loved them. In spite of their warts, my 90 had terrible suspension, but I didn't care. I loved it anyway. Great machine. I had the 250, the 125, and the 500 that year. So, great bike. Now, if you'd like to check out Part 1, I'll put a link here to it. You can check that out as well. I've done a lot of other retrospectives, the history of the CR80 and some other stuff. If you want to check those out, if you'd like to share and subscribe, let your friends know about this channel, I'd really appreciate the support. Uh, if you want to support the channel and what I do, I have some Motocross Vault merch available. Some new chicken design there I just got. I just started something new. I did a mask here. We all have to wear masks these days. If you're going to the new Supercrosses, you know you're going to have to be wearing masks. And I did this Bradshaw design. I think it turned out really well. I put his numbers here. You can't see them all, but there's 45 and what have you. Um, <laughs> it got the numbers on one side and his 92YZs on the other. Uh, so it's. Uh, I think it turned out pretty well. It's actually a little thicker material because it's reversible too. Like I said, the, seat, the, the motorcycle's on the other side. So it's a little thicker than some of the other ones I bought. So maybe it'll help a little bit. Uh, wearing a mask is a pain, but let's all stay safe, people. So in any case, if you want to check that out, uh, I'll put a link to my Teespring store in the description below. Uh, so going forward, here is the story of the Honda CR250 from 1990 until its demise in 2007. Now we come to a machine that has a very soft spot in my heart, the all-new 1990 CR250. Now this year, they kept the same basic motor design again, uh, still used the HPP, but the chassis was completely redesigned. You have an all-new frame, revised suspension, new bodywork. Now, I know a lot of people probably don't love this design as much as the 89. In hindsight, I think the 89 probably is a prettier motorcycle, mainly because the white frame is a little strange. But I, particularly at the time, I love this return to the Honda Orange, the flash red. Again, I love that flash red. It's my favorite Honda color combo of all time. And I, at the time, I was so excited to see it come back. I love it now still. It isn't quite as colorful as the 87 was because of the, you know, it doesn't have a blue seat and what have you, but I think it's a good looking motorcycle. Uh, again, maybe the 89 side plates are a little cleaner design, but overall, really good looking bike. Now, for 90, they kind of went back to the 86 style power. Uh, this engine, they broadened the, the low end. The 89 had a soft low end, really strong mid range, strong top end, ran like the 87. And in 90, what they did was they kind of brought that power down a little bit and gave it a 86 style power band. So it's really strong, but still very broad. It's electric. I love this engine. I remember I'd get on my buddy's RM250 and it felt like I had to shift three times for every one shift on my CR. 
Uh, one time I broke the clutch mid moto, uh, and I, I basically just left it in third everywhere. And the thing would just, you could just scream it down the straights and it would lug out of the turns. It was really an awesome do it all engine. I love this engine. The chassis, even though the frame was new, it basically handles exactly like the uh, 1989 in terms of the handling. It's, it's geared way more towards turning than stability. All of these CRs in the late 80s, early 90s are, are sketchy as hell at speed, uh, particularly when coming down from speed. They didn't, they didn't head shake at, you know, when you're doing 90 miles an hour down a straight. It was when you would go into the turn at the end of that straight and roll off the throttle, get on the brakes, and you'd load those front forks, and then it would get that wobble that was uh, pretty terrifying at times. The shock and forks, again, grim. The forks are marginally improved. They weren't as absolutely terrible as 89, but you're talking, you're splitting hairs here. They were still garbage. Um, I remember I, I got mine revalved, and they would work great for about a week or two if you were riding all the time. Back then, I was doing a lot of racing and riding, and uh, they, they would quickly get this particulate in there. The, the internals rubbed against each other, and it would shave off tiny little bits of aluminum and these things would get garbaged up, and you'd have to change the fork oil every couple of weeks, or it would, I mean, obviously a pro is going to do it all after every race, but, you know, I'm just an amateur spode, but you, if you didn't change your fork oil regularly, it was, um, the, the fork damping went all to hell pretty fast, and uh, even at best, it was not great. I remember spending so many hours spinning dials on these damn things, trying to get them to work, and I never could find a setting that was great. It was always just mediocre uh, you know, I'd ride a buddy of mine's bike, yeah, you know, and it was like, holy Christ, how the suspension, the suspension difference back then was real. It was a big difference. But uh, now I, when I got my 90, a couple, what, 90, uh, I guess 2016, 15, when I did mine, I sent it out to Race Tech. They redid the forks and the shock and they worked phenomenally. So nowadays you could get them working. But back in 89, I think they were still, uh, 89, 90, they were still trying to figure out how to make these new inverted forks work. But Overall, this is, I think, by most people's opinion at the time, it could have been the best machine with the suspension work because uh, it had the the best engine, best handling, great layout. The new layout was super slim, like I said, uh, but the, the suspension really held it back from being the perfect motocrosser in 1990. For 1991, the CR250 was back with by far the least amount of changes that any CR250 had had in a decade. Probably this is the least changed machine since the 78-79 CR. Pretty much every year after that, Honda would either change the frame or change the engine or change the bodywork every year. And this 91 is very, very similar to 90. The only difference is they switched to a Kiyaba shock in the back from the Shawa of 1990. They did some minor uh, changes to the forks to try and get them to work better. Added an all-new bottoming system and a spring-above cartridge design. Uh, they added some Teflon uh, linkage bushings to try and reduce friction, and they made some subtle changes to the carburetor. But other than that, the bike is exactly the same. They didn't change anything with the engine, the chassis, none of that stuff. The motor's ex identical. Now, appearance-wise, this thing made a pretty drastic difference. I, I was really scratching my head in 91. Now, this is where motocross started getting a little weird for a couple of years. Uh, in 91, Suzuki went completely crazy with their, I don't know, looks like your cat barfed on it graphics on your uh, on the RMs. And Honda added this uh, Tiger stripe. I, I just, I don't know who the hell thought this was a great idea. Now, now I think it looks kind of cool, but in 91, I was like, what the bleep is this? Um, the, the white shrouds I didn't think were a good look, and the CR graphics I thought were hideous. Now, again, you know hindsight being like it is and 20 years later i feel a little different about this motorcycle now in terms of the appearance but i hated it in 91 um and it was really kind of a strange look and basically that's the only thing that that sets the 91 apart from the 90 is the the crazy graphics other than that they're basically the same they both had awesome motors and crap suspension uh, in spite of the switch to to kiaba shock the shock was really no better the inverted forks worked only a tiny bit better so which leads me to believe that the problem was in Honda's testing department. It wasn't necessarily in the components because, you know, you look at a Kawasaki with Kiyaba stuff and it worked phenomenal. You stick the Kiyaba stuff on a Honda and it works crappy. So uh, I would imagine it had to do something with the settings or something they were doing setting it up. But overall, certainly an iconic looking motorcycle, but uh, not much different than 90 in terms of performance. After a very mild refresh in 91, the CR250 was back in 92 with a complete redesign. Now this is a clean sheet, everything is new. Appearance-wise, you can tell the CR definitely changed quite a bit. This is the first year for the nuclear red color, which is 
Uh, in these photos, it doesn't really do it justice. It was much more of a pink color, almost a translucent pink in person. Uh, in photos, it looks more deep red. Really, the 93 and 94 color is closer uh, to what this looks like in a photo. Uh, again, in person, it was it was not this dark. Uh, I hated this look. Again, you're going to hear that a lot. I'm not, I've never been... When they make a drastic change, usually I'm slow to pick up on that. I think it looks cool now. I didn't like the white tank. I didn't like the white airbox. Uh, all that stuff I thought was weird, but I know a lot of people love it, and I, I do I do appreciate it now. Now, this new chassis was a little tighter handling. Believe it or not, they actually went even more aggressive with this 92 chassis, and it turned phenomenally. Now, there were some issues initially. The, the chassis was a little bit underbuilt, and they had problems with swing arms cracking and some other issues. And the factory team actually ended up adding a bunch of bracing to the bike. And uh, at the time, if you were going to race it, or you're going to ride it really hard, it would have been a good idea to have a few of the weak spots addressed. But handling-wise, I think most people love this bike. Now, engine-wise, this is the first year where they retired the HPP, the Honda Powerport system, which they had employed since 1986. They introduced this all-new CRV composite racing valve engine. Now, this is the first year that basically combined those two technologies that I talked about earlier. This is essentially... In th I guess in theory, a copy of what Kawasaki was doing with the KIPP system, where it combined the variable exhaust port of the HPP and the resonance chamber of the ATAC into one design. Uh, this engine was uh, lighter and much easier to work on. They said it had half the, the moving parts in it that the HPP did. Again, the HPP worked very well. It was awesome motor in terms of performance, but it was a nightmare. It required constant maintenance. It was a pain in the butt to get it taken apart and put back together, and it was really easy to screw it up when you did it. Uh, so this new engine was lower maintenance and even more powerful. Now this engine, way more mid to up. Uh, it's not a, a as torquey probably as 91. It doesn't have that same electric style of power they had this two last years. This is much more of an 89 style where it's a mid and up rocket ship. And this is a very fast motor. Uh, this engine it pretty much would be the dominant engine in motocross for many years to come. Now, the forks this year, they were new as well. They're 43 millimeter sliders, a little bit smaller. In, in 91, they'd use a 45 millimeter. And what they were trying to do was to dial back some, uh, some of that rigidity. These first inverted forks, you know, they provided just terrible feedback in your hands. They were very stiff, and uh, they were trying to get some flex back into it. They went one way really strong with all that uh, rigidity, and they were trying to get a little bit more compliance out of them. They didn't work great. None of these early 90s forks are, are worth a damn. To be honest, Honda doesn't end up with a decent set of forks probably until about 2000 or so, uh, until they finally started getting this sorted out. So varying degrees of crappy. Uh, the, the Kawasaki's pretty much had suspension performance on lockdown in these years, and the Honda's shocks and forks were not great. But the engine was blazing fast, by far the fastest motor. Uh, handled phenomenally. Uh, super tight turning. Again, still had some head shake, but that was to be expected. It was kind of what people thought a Honda was like at that point. They'd kind of figured out this niche, and that's what they were they were aiming for. Great motorcycle, and ended up winning the uh, Supercross title yet again. After an all-new machine in 1992, the CR250 was back with pretty minor changes for 93. There was an all-new intake system with 20% larger airbox, and that was helped to basically boost low-end power. They also changed the reed valve assembly a little bit. Uh, the 92 was super fast, as I said, but again, it ran more like the 89. The engine was a little bit soft, off-idle, and uh, really hit really hard in the mid-range and up. So for 1993, Honda tried to bring that power down a little bit, make the bike a little easier to ride, and actually it worked. The 93 did pick up a little better off the off idle and uh, snapped to not quite as violent a mid-range, so it made the bike a little easier to ride. Even though it had the same amount of power overall, uh, it picked up a little better down low. They increased the uh, capacity of the oil in the transmission a little bit to help uh, address some reliability issues. They also beefed up the frame. They made several changes to the frame in order to address those issues from the 92 where there was flex problems and also cracking. Uh, the Shawa forks were revised slightly, had new damping in them. They're still a 43 millimeter design. They also increased the size of the shaft and the Shawa shock slightly from 14 millimeters to 16 millimeters. And they added a lot of little, little minor things, changed the seat foam slightly, uh, thickened the seat cover to be more durable so it would not tear as easily. And they also changed the shade. As I said, this first uh, 92 version is more of a, a pinky red, this first nuclear red. And the problem with that was, again, color was a little weird to start out with, and it faded very badly. If you crashed the bike, if you laid it over, it got these ugly white 
uh, white marks in the plastic. Something about the dye was very thin. Uh, you could, like I said, the sun would kind of go through. It was almost translucent, and it faded really badly. As soon as you had your bike out at the track for a couple of months, it quickly turned salmon. So for 1993, they actually changed the shade of the color. Honda describes it as a more orangey shade of red. Now, if you go and buy some plastic now for your CR250 or 92 or something, you're actually going to get this 93 color. Uh, this is The 92 was a unique one-year shade, and I don't think anybody makes it, and Lord knows you probably can't get it from Honda. So uh, if you can't find some OEM stuff lying around on eBay, you're not going to find it. It's a very weird color. I, I didn't li like that uh, 92 color at all, but I love the 93 and 94 or 95. The, the uh, more orangey red, the darker red they went with in 93 is a big improvement in my opinion. Not a giant fan of these 93 graphics. Uh, pretty much the 92 and 93 are my least favorite Honda graphics probably of all time. I'm just not a huge fan of this overall look. But um, the but the chassis and what have you is a good looking motorcycle. I think the, the basic design's good. I just thought these graphics were kind of plain. I, I always thought you should have a Honda wing on the shroud. Just having this giant CR was uh, not my favorite. In terms of performance, the bike, as I said, did run a little better than 92. It was a little easier to ride. The forks and shock continued to be the worst in the class. I mean, the, the shock worked a little better than the forks. The forks were still total garbage. Uh, the shock was at least decently raceable in stock condition. You could race it and not get killed on the thing. Uh, but the forks were grim. You're probably going to want to have them uh, revalved if you were, you know, not just out play riding or something like that. Overall, the bike, again, great handling, great motor, crap suspension, rinse, repeat. For 1994, the CR250 was back with a actually surprising amount of changes. Even though this bike looks virtually identical to 93, they actually changed a lot in terms of the chassis. Of all the 92 through 93, 94, this is by far my favorite graphics. I actually, in, even though there's no Honda wing on it, I actually love this graphic. I ended up putting it on my 1990 at one point, uh, updated it the 90 with the fluorescent red plastic, and put these 94 graphics on it. Uh, I think it's actually pretty good looking. Like I said, if you're going to go with one of these that don't have the Honda wing on it, this is by far my favorite. Good looking motorcycle in general, I think. For 94, Honda increased the wheelbase 12 millimeters. Uh, they also moved the engine slightly. They moved it 5 millimeters closer to the front axle and up 5 millimeters. Uh, the steering head was moved 7 millimeters rearward and 3 millimeters downward. The steering offset was decreased from 26 millimeters to 24 millimeters. And the swing arm was 10 millimeters longer. They also moved the foot peg slightly back 10 millimeters and up 10 millimeters. Now, all this was done in an effort to address that head shake we talked about. All these CRs, pretty much from 83 through 93, Phenomenal turners, uh, but really sketchy. It's uh, coming down from speed. The head shake was pretty violent. So for 94, Honda tried to address this and dial back that a little bit, maybe get a little less aggressive on the handling end. And by most counts, it was, you know, moderately successful. The bike still turned really well, uh, particularly compared to like the Kawasaki's and what have you. Uh, and there was a little less head shake, but it really still was a Honda CR. Infamously, Jeremy McGrath did not like these changes, and he ended up running the 93 chassis up until he left Honda. And in 94, Honda went a little different direction. Some people liked to change, some people didn't. It was really a personal preference. The head shake always scared the living crap out of me, so anytime the bike was less likely to rip the bars out of my hands, I was happy. Uh, but a really fast guy, maybe they prioritized that turning prowess over handling, over high-speed stability. So it really depends on your skill and also what kind of riding you were doing. For 94, Honda made a few minor changes. Um, they changed the uh, CRV valve slightly. Uh, they also modified the intake ports and exhaust ports slightly. Uh, basically trying to get the motor to be a little more electric and smooth again. Kind of the same thing they did in 93. Uh, the new engine was a little, little, I guess, broader, but it still basically ran the same. It, you'd have to be splitting hairs to see any major difference. Uh, the silencer was bigger for 94. Uh, they went with a, uh, I guess... I don't know if the AMA was actually raising the sound requirements or what, but you'll notice all the all the uh, Hondas got bigger silencers in 1994, uh, and this was designed, I guess, to make the bike a little more quiet. I don't know that it made a huge difference in performance. Like I said, they said the 94 motor ran a little smoother. I don't know if that's a, a factor of the larger silencer or the porting changes or what have you, but more or less it was the same. Suspension changes. Again, they revised the uh, valving in the forks, trying to get them to work better. Uh, stock, they were a little too soft, and the bike kind of gave you a stink bug stance. I mean, it was kind of high in the rear and low in the front, kind of hung down. If you swapped out the fork springs and evened out the chassis, the bike, like I said, handled a lot better. And the forks were livable. Again, not great. Still pretty much acknowledged as the worst forks in the class. 
but they were not as atrocious as they had been before. They were probably the best Forks Honda it had since 87, but considering all the other ones before it were just terrible, that wasn't saying a whole lot. Um, overall, great looking motorcycle and certainly a hugely successful one on the track. For 1995, the CR250 featured by far the biggest visual change in terms of appearance, probably since 92. This was the first year they went, and the only year, thankfully, they went to the purple graphics. This is another time when I was absolutely dumbfounded by this decision. I thought it was just hideous. Thing looked like a clown car to me. I was, I'm like, what? Purple was just all the rage in the 90s. If you're familiar with all these machines, pretty much every bike had purple in some kind. And I actually like purple. Purple's fine. I love the 94 KX look. For some reason, though, this 90, uh, the CR, maybe because it's the red on purple, it just never worked for me. I just thought it was strange. The fact that the graphics going to the tank, I, I just thought, well, this will, those will probably flake off in five minutes. Just wasn't my cup of tea. I mean, I, I guess I appreciate it a little bit now, but in general, just didn't really care for the look. Now, 95 here gets an all-new side plate. I don't think it's as elegant as the 93, 94, 92 look. It's larger. Clearly, they did that to give it uh, a little more room for your numbers, or maybe just to say they changed something. But overall, eh, not not really a big fan of the, the overall look here and the, the graphics. Now, I know a lot of people love it, but I'm sorry if I, I'm just not one of them. This new machine is changed subtly. It's not a major redesign in terms of the overall chassis. The motor, they had some new porting. They lowered the all the ports by 0.5 millimeters, reshaped the exhaust port, uh, basically in an effort to get a little more a little more of that smooth, linear, low-end power. They keep trying to do that. I guess in 92, it was you know ran like a scalded cat, and then every year they tried to smooth it out a little bit. I never actually have ridden a 95. I owned a 96, and I didn't think it was... Even in 96, I didn't think it had a massive low end. None of these motors are had the chunky low end of the Kawasaki's at the time. There really are mid and up engines. And every year they made some changes to try and bring that power down a little bit. But uh, they really just all kind of ran the same. Now for 95, the silencer's a little bit bigger. They also changed the configuration of the... There's like a little barrier in the reed valve. In 94, it was vertical. In 95, it's horizontal. Um, just a lot of little stuff that didn't add up to a much different power characteristic. Now, the chassis is mostly unchanged. They didn't change the basic design of it. They did enlarge the steering stem. Uh, the, the main TED tube there is 7 millimeters larger and also a little bit taller as well. And they moved the handlebars down and the clamp slightly to make sure that that kept the same basic layout. For 1995, the foot pegs are 5 millimeters larger. This is the first year where Honda really went to what you would consider a modern wide peg in the style that Kawasaki had started in 1990. The seat was reshaped slightly. It was a little bit flatter in the back and more rounded on the edges. And the seat foam was actually 12% denser uh, for 1995. And one of the large changes was this was the first year that Honda went to a 19-inch rear wheel. Uh, everybody else had gone to a 19 and I believe 1989 and Honda had steadfastly stayed with the 18 all these years. I'm not sure why. I don't know whether they thought it was better because the race team was still using 19s. Uh, but they were, on the production side, going with a 18-inch wheel. This certainly gave you a softer ride in theory. Uh, it maybe gave you a little bit of flat protection. I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's a reason why they still use 18-inch wheels on off-road bikes. But Honda was steadfastly sticking with this for several years after everybody else had, had abandoned them. And in 1995, they finally made the switch to the 19-inch, at least on the 250 and the 125. The 500 would continue to use the 18-inch wheel until it was finally retired for good in 2001. Probably the biggest change other than the appearance is the suspension. In uh, early 90s, Honda struggled mightily with suspension. They just couldn't seem to get it right. And from year to year, they would completely swap manufacturers. They would go Shawa one year, then Kayaba the next, and some years they'd have uh, I think even on the 125, they may have even done a Shawa fork and a Kiawa shock one year. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly, but they did some weird stuff there. In 94, the 125 had had Kiawa stuff and the 250 and 500 had had Shawa. For 95, they swapped all Kiawa to the big bikes. So these forks and shock were all new this year. Again, they didn't end up performing a whole lot better than the old one, which was funny because this is basically the same fork that you found on the Kawasaki's, which was great. And on the Hondas, it just didn't perform very well. So again, I think unless there was something inherently wrong with the geometry of the chassis, it had to be set up at the factory. So something with their testers, either here or in Japan, was lost in the translation, and the, the stock bike just didn't perform that great. 
I think with work, these were better. Again, they were getting incrementally better, but it was a slight improvement year over year. It wasn't great. Um, again, if you're looking for a super tight handling motorcycle, this was a great choice. If you're looking for something for desert racing, not the hot setup for sure. Um, and the styling was love it or hate it, but on the track, it was certainly very successful. Jeremy McGrath took one of these, although he was riding in 93, <laughs> took one of these to the 250 Outdoor National and Supercross title in 95. Maybe one of the greatest years for Honda ever in terms of performance. They had the 125 on lockdown as well uh, with Steve Lance. And so great year for the brand. Not a great year for styling, in my opinion, but uh, I'll leave that opinion up to you. For 96, the CR was back with what would turn out to be the last year of the steel frames. Uh, I owned this motorcycle, really loved it, great machine. Really the only thing I had uh, that I wanted done was maybe a little bit more low end, and I ended up going with a, an FMF pipe that beefed up the low end a little bit. But again, I was riding 50-50 woods riding and motocross. So uh, if you're riding just straight up motocross, and depending on your speed, of course, maybe not an issue. Uh, the stock gearing was changed this year. They actually lowered it slightly. They added one more tooth to the rear end to kind of help beef up that low end feel. So at least the, even though the bike did not have a lot more torque, uh, it did come on the pipe a little easier. Every year they adjusted it slightly. For 96, the exhaust port was changed slightly. It was a little bit narrower and that was done to give it a little better low end and mid range. Again, they're trying to beef up that low end. The carburetor was a tiny bit larger uh, for 1996. They also rev revised the shift fork shaft slightly to give smoother shifting. Really all these bikes, the Honda was pretty much considered the best shifting bike at that time. Uh, I never had any issue with the shifting or clutch on my Honda CRs. I've had a lot of them over the years now. I thought they all worked really well. Certainly better than like the Yamahas at that time. Uh, they revised the kickstart gear for a little more reliability. I never had an issue with any of my CRs breaking the kickstarter, but I guess some people did. Uh, the only one I ever broke was on my 83 480, but that was actually the, sh the actual kickstart lever snapping in half, not the gear inside. Uh, the foot pegs were moved slightly five millimeters lower. Uh, this basic bike... Very similar, as I said, really just minor changes. The fork is larger for 1996. They upgraded it from a 43 millimeter to a 46 millimeter fork. Compared to the competition, uh, the suspension was not great this year. I, again, did not have any major issues with mine. I thought it worked pretty well. It wasn't as plush as like a Kawasaki at the time, but this 96 machine was certainly rideable stock, raceable stock. It wasn't as god-awful as some of the earlier ones I had, which were almost unrideable with the stock suspension. So, again, they were getting a little better over time. Now, I like the looks of this bike, as I said, much better. The ditching of the purple was a huge <laughs> improvement in my book. I like the fact that the side panels are white. I think it looks better than the, than the red side panels did. I'm not a fan of the stock graphics this year. I, I like the yellow on red look. That part's good, but that, again, I think it would look better with the Honda Wing on there, but you know, picking nits here. Overall, this is a phenomenal machine, a, guy, a machine that a lot of people love. It wasn't rated the best machine actually in 1996, but a lot of people still love it, just probably as much for Jeremy McGrath as any reason, and the fact that this is the end of a generation. This is the last of what people would think of like as a great CR for quite a while, maybe ever, because in 97 they went to the all-new frame, and uh, in 2002, when they finally got the suspension, the frame sorted out, they had uh, went to a case reed motor that wasn't as popular. So in any case, great, great machine uh, in many people's minds. I loved mine and the end of an era for Honda for sure. All right, we've come to one of the most influential motorcycles of the last 30 years in terms of design, the 1997 Honda CR250. If you look at every top level motocross machine other than like a KTM, a Husqvarna out there now, they use a aluminum perimeter frame, and this is the first machine to kind of take that plunge. In 97, Honda introduced this chassis, and I can't tell you how blown away excited I was for this motorcycle. Pretty much the only other time I've been that excited to see a motorcycle was in 1990 when Kawasaki came out with their first perimeter frame. I thought that machine was amazing to look at, and just when I first saw it in the magazines, I was totally thunderstruck. And this Honda had the same effect on me. I thought the thing was so cool. Uh, the bike looked amazing. I still love the looks of it. Uh, it's a really spacey looking machine. It looked, you know, 10 years ahead of anything else at the time in terms of styling. It was just a really cool motorcycle. And Honda, I think, in terms of styling, killed it this year. It was a neat looking machine. I love the ads. I couldn't wait to see one in person. Just an amazing bike. Now, what's interesting is that other than the chassis, this is a pretty conventional machine. The engine was the same basic design it had used in 96 with some modif minor modifications, although it did run much differently. 
Uh, after years of trying to broaden the power, Honda embraced its uh, mid-range up roots in 97, and this new machine ran very much like the 92 did. There was not a lot of low end at all. It was not real snappy off the line, but it came on like a freight train in the mid-range and revved to the moon. It was a really, really fast motorcycle, uh, but not as easy to ride as 96. Now, one of my best buddies bought one of these. He had... Uh, Traded in his 1988 CR125 on one, and I riding it back to back with my 96. I found the bike to be shockingly stiff feeling and just kind of weird. It had a very different feel. The seat was very thin, rock hard compared to the 96. I thought the bike felt probably twice as wide. Um, the 96, if you sit on one, is very compact feeling. The the bike feels short and small and just kind of tossable and this 97 felt wider and longer it just had a just a very different feel year over year probably the biggest difference honda ever did from one year to the next in terms of the way they felt now it's funny if you look back and read the tests when i go back through them this bike was actually loved initially a lot of the magazines raved about them and it's only over time that people seem to sour on this 97 uh the the chassis very stiff i mean that's really the beef with it i think honda initially uh, when they were people, you listen to people like Rich Taylor and some of the guys doing the testing, they loved this bike. They had a really good aluminum chassis they were testing back in Japan, but I think they had some failures with it and they were concerned that, the, you know, people would go out there and snap these things in half. Um, you got to figure road race machines have been using alloy chassis for years, but they number one, they're huge. If you look at an alloy chassis on a road race bike, it's certainly more substantial and it's not getting put under the same load. You know, you're not jumping a, you know, a GSXR. You know, 60 feet through the air. So Honda, I think, was concerned that people were going to break these machines and they ended up with a bunch of lawsuits, kind of like what happened to, uh, you know, Mako years ago. So they went the other way and kind of beefed this thing up as much as possible for reliability. And the problem was that kind of deadened the feel. Um, I actually had a 99 CR125 and very similar chassis to this. It, the bike just felt dead is the best way to put it you hit things and the bike kind of thudded it just didn't have that compliant feel that you would expect in a steel chassis i think some people liked it people like ezra lusk went fast on these things in the 98 99 other people weren't as psyched with it uh, the, the bike you know the chassis was kind of a love it or hate it thing you hear people now that say it's not so bad i don't know my experience was i didn't like it in 97 i didn't like my 99 never really went well with me personally but some people had the bike had definitely have his devotees Overall, I think the machine was a decent handler this year. Uh, they tried to go with like a 93 geometry on this, but it just didn't work as well. There's so many things that go into that. It's not just geometry. It has to do with chassis compliance and the motor performance, suspension settings. All those things work together. And the bike was really mediocre turning, not great at speed. It just wasn't as tight of a handler as previous Hondas had been. Uh, the engine was probably the best feature. People love the um, awesome top-end power the thing had. That was probably the strong suit. Chassis-wise, it was mediocre, uh, very stiff. They also numbed your hands. Holy crap, these things would vibrate. That, that aluminum chassis, just you felt every power pulse through them, and it used to numb my hands pretty quick. I, I hated that part of it, but the forks and shock worked decently. They were better than previous efforts, weren't great. Um, I think, like I said, at the time, people were pretty high on it. Over time, they've been pretty rough on this machine and kind of roasted it over the coals, but it was definitely an important machine, and Honda really took the plunge. Like I said, everybody else has followed their suit, like they did with the ProLink originally. Pretty much everybody has followed their initial design and fine-tuned it, clearly. It took Honda until 2002 to finally get this chassis kind of right, uh, but they were willing to take the plunge in 97. They certainly showed in the sales. They sold a ton of these in spite of the fact that uh, maybe it wasn't the best motorcycle that year. For 1998, the CR250 was back with only minor changes. After being all new the year before, the 125 received the lion's shares of updates in 98, this was the first year that the 125 went to the all-new aluminum chassis, a move that turned out to have much worse results on the 125 than it did on the 250 for some reason. Interestingly, when they moved to the alloy chassis, it did not seem to affect the power of the 250 at all. And if anything, the bike was even more powerful in 97. But on the 125, something about the Airbach design or something else internally that uh, was changed with the move neutered the power. Uh, the CR125 had been the most powerful machine in the class for many years, and uh, the Yamaha had kind of come on in 96 and started to supplant it. But in 98, things really went downhill. And this alloy uh, frame CR was a turd. I had the 99, as I said, and it was just a dog. It was awful. So thankfully, the 250 did not suffer the same fate. For 98, they only made some very minor jetting changes. 
Uh, now, 97, they had added a power jet carburetor to the 250. I forgot to mention that. And that what that did was it was an electronic uh, supplemental jetting circuit in the carburetor that would uh, give a little more fuel to the motor based on what the electronic ignition was telling the carburetor. With a normal mechanical carburetor, you know, it doesn't know what the engine is doing so much as it just knows throttle position, you know, by the, sl the slide. By integrating the ignition and the electronics into the carburetor, it can, in theory, give a little fuel when it needed it. Pretty neat setup. It's funny that they, they went with this for several years and then they dropped it. So I don't know whether it was not particularly effective, but the power jet was all the rage for a few years here in the late 90s. Now, this engine, as I said, was basically the same. The 98 model ran just identical to 97. No big difference at all. Still a soft low end, hugely strong mid-range, and really strong top end. Great, great pro motor. Uh, as you can see, but Ronnie Mack still uses it today. Now, the chassis, they made a few minor changes. They subtly updated the geometry to make the bike turn a little uh, tighter for 1998. They also dialed up some changes to try and increase a little bit of compliance in the chassis. Not nearly enough, though. The bike was still extremely rigid, uh, very stiff feeling, uh, still felt like concrete when you rode it. So uh, definitely not a whole lot of difference. They, it would have to wait till the major redesign in 2000 to really address those issues. Um, Suspension-wise, they did uh, change the shock for 1998. Uh, the 98 shock has a new linkage, and the uh, shock is slightly longer. Uh, there, It went from 12.6 inches of travel to 12.9 inches. And uh, this was something that the, I guess, the race team had used in 97, and they brought to the factory, uh, the production machine in 1998. Overall, the bike was more or less the same it had been the year before. Um, at the time, in the late 90s here, the Kawasaki KX250 was pretty much acknowledged as the best machine. It had a burly low to mid power that people, uh, the magazines in particular, liked. Uh, the Honda ran very differently. It was equally powerful, but a uh, different style of power. Uh, the handling, it was a little bit better, but still... Uh, these bikes just didn't feel as precise as some of the older ones. Uh, it was one of these love it or hate it. I think, like I said, some people really like these bikes. I was never a big fan. Uh, it really just depends on what you what you, what you can tolerate in terms of rigidity and feel. The suspension was a little bit better, but still not great. Uh, the RMs and uh, Kawasaki's had better suspension in this era in general. Uh, and the Honda was just a little bit be behind the times as far as that goes. It was getting a little bit better from year to year. And uh, they were slowly getting it sorted out. Again, way, way better than earlier models. Certainly usable in stock condition. The suspension wasn't terrible by any means. Um, you know, the, if this was all you rode, you were probably fine with it. Uh, not not nearly in the Roman catapult category of suspension performance. Uh, overall, really just a mild retread. Handsome bike, though. I still love the looks. Uh, this move to the, uh, the black seat I thought was pretty good-looking bike. Kind of reflected the works look from the year before. A uh, good-looking motorcycle. Again, I think it holds up. But uh, performance-wise, you know, the one thing about it was you weren't going to break the frame, at least, I guess. For 1999, Honda looked to address some of the issues riders had complained about on the 1998 CR250. After the glowing reviews of 97, Big Red took a hit in the court of public opinion in 98 after word got out about actually living with the alloy-framed wonder. The 98 CR's harsh feel, mediocre suspension, and top-end focus power were out of step with the current taste in the 250 class. People wanted plushness and torque out of their 250s, and the KX had that in spades. Many riders were not able to come to grips with the CR's chassis and suspension, and Honda knew that changes were needed to bring some of these disenchanted buyers back into the fold. For 1999, Honda tried to assuage some of these turned-off consumers by employing a number of changes aimed at reducing fatigue and increasing ease of use. First up was a list of changes to the CR's 249cc power plant designed to compete with Kawasaki by beefing up the Honda's rather pedestrian low-end power. For 99, the engineers dialed up a totally new cylinder, they revamped the power valve, reworked the head, and redesigned the reed valve. The 250 also got a new 16-bit microprocessor for more precise ignition and an all-new carb that ditched the power jet that they had introduced only two years before. Next up was the chassis department, where most of the new Hondas tended to receive the lion's share of their complaints. In 98, Honda had gone softer with the settings of the suspension in an attempt to bring some of the comfort back to the chassis. Unfortunately, this turned out to do very little to actually increase comfort, and it only succeeded in annoying the fast guys who felt the new settings were far too soft. For 99, the engineers added stiffer fork springs and revised valving, aimed at keeping the forks farther up in the stroke and providing a better feel. Outback, a new shock took away the added length they had added in 98 and returned to the shorter setup of 1997. This change relaxed the steering angle somewhat and lowered the seat a tiny bit. Lastly, to address complaints about comfort, the CR250 received a much needed set of rubber bar mounts to reduce vibration and a new softer seat foam to take some of the bite out of those hard landings. 
Unfortunately for Honda, all of these changes did not add up to a appreciably better motorcycle. While some areas showed significant improvement, others suffered major setbacks. First up on the fail list was the performance of the new engine. Even with all the changes, the sought-after low-end power never really materialized. The bike was still soft down low, with an explosive blast of power in the middle. Where things changed was on top, there the new motor refused to rev out as previous CR250s had done. It was similar to what had happened to the CR125 the year before, when the redesign neutered what had been the old model's strong point. The new non-power jet carburetor also proved a nightmare to jet, and made the raspy low end even harder to use. When it was on the pipe, it was wicked fast, but that sweet spot was far narrower than any CR250 since 1985. The endless pull that had been the CR stock in trade for over a decade was completely missing in 1999. Fast Guys lamented its lack of top end, Slow Guys had trouble with its monstrous hit, and everyone else hated its finicky jetting. While the motor changes were not well regarded, the suspension updates were well received. The new stiffer spring rates and revised damping kept the bike from crashing to the stops over every gum wrapper left on the track, and the softer seat and rubber mounted bars toned down the vibration and tailbone pain quite a bit. It was still the harshest chassis in the class, but it was slightly more pleasant than previous alloy frame CRs. If you were super aggressive and fast, it worked fairly well, but for most riders, the YZ and the KX were much easier to live with in 99. As we moved into the new decade, Honda was coming off three tough years in the 250 class. Since the shocking departure of Jeremy McGrath at the end of 1996, the brand had failed to win a single motocross or supercross title. They had also seen the initial fervor for the radical alloy frame CR250 morph into grumbling discontent nearly overnight, in virtually every meaningful way the new aluminum frame CRs were a step back from the bikes they had replaced. They were harsh, heavy feeling, and just plain exhausting to ride. If you were fast and aggressive like Ezra Lusk, they could be made to work, but if you were more mortal, they pretty much beat you to death. Knowing that their first generation bike had met with very mixed reviews, Honda set about making things right with generation two. By most estimates, the main issue with the first alloy frame CRs had been their absurd rigidity. Initially, Durability concerns had led Honda to err on the side of caution when building the frame for the 97CR. Every frame section and weld was beefed up, and the result was a frame that didn't snap in half, but also didn't work very well on the track. It handled poorly, transmitted a ton of vibration, and gave the bike a very numb and dead feeling. For 2000, Honda set about dialing down their rigidity and feeding a little feel back into the chassis of the CR250. To do that, the bike received an all-new frame that was slimmer, lower, and leaner. The new frame retained the twin spar construction of 99 that featured a narrower set of frame spars and a reconfigured steering head. They also switched to a single down tube from the dual down tubes of 97 through 99. This also meant a swap back to dual radiators from the single large radiator that had been used on the first generation alloy frame. The new frame featured revised geometry as well as a new swing arm and a reconfigured ProLink linkage. Lastly, the new 250 received all new bodywork a new set of graphics, and a switch in color to a less deep red Honda called Explosion Red. In the motor department, the CR250 soldiered on into 2000 with only a few minor changes. The composite racing valve was extended downward in the cylinder to better seal against the exhaust port, and the exhaust subports were reshaped for slightly less turbulence. In the carb, a new triple tapered needle was added, and a new airbox boosted volume by 35% over 99. Lastly, a new expansion chamber was spec to work with the revised porting and mounted up on the redesigned frame. On the track, the new 2000 CR made major strides over 99. The new frame was a significant improvement over the previous design. The bike felt lighter, turned better, and fed less vibration to your hands. It was still stiffer than anything else in the class, and the suspension was only mediocre, but at least the bike no longer vibrated your hands to death and pounded your backside to pulp after 10 minutes on the track. The motor ran very similar to 99 with a strong mid-range and not much else. Low end and top end power were unimpressive, but the bike remained competitive with its burly mid-range pull. The minor motor changes of 2000 yielded some small rideability improvements, but for the most part it was the same engine that had met with very mixed reviews the year before. It was potent and punchy, but a far cry from the omnipotent Honda motors of the early 90s. Overall though, the 2000 CR250 was a significantly improved machine. It still lacked the power characteristics to rest the top spot in the class away from Yamaha, but at least it was no longer the caboose of the class. The new chassis changes yielded real-world improvements, and the bike was at least competitive against the best machines in the class. After the disappointments of 99, that was certainly a major step in the right direction. For 2001, the majority of changes were aimed at bringing back the CR's legendary top-end pull. 
After two years of mid-range only deuce and a halves, it was time to bring the CR back to its roots. Reshaped porting, a revised ignition, a new reed valve, and a switch to a McCuny TMX carburetor were all aimed at stretching the CR's narrow power band. In order to improve breathing, Honda also enlarged the air inlets on the side panels by 20% and bolted on an all-new expansion chamber. On the chassis side, Honda chose to keep changes minimal for 2001. The overall geometry was the same as the year before, and the only real change was the availability of a new 20-inch front wheel. The 20-inch front wheel was a trick the factory team had been using for a few years, and it was designed to take a little bit of the bite out of that stiff aluminum frame. It was an option that some riders swore by and loved, others didn't really notice much of a difference, but it was nice that Honda at least made it available as an option. In addition to the new front hoop, the 250 received stiffer springs both front and rear, and an all-new high-flow piston for the shock. On the track, the machine benefited greatly from all the off-season changes. With stiffer springs and valving, it did a much better job of absorbing the track than it did in 2000. There was still a slight hint of harshness on slap-down landings, but in general, it was by far the best Honda suspension package in over a decade. On the motor side, the Honda was also much improved for 2001. The revised settings offered a much wider power band and a stronger pull. There was still less torque than you would have found on the YZ or KX, but the strong, long top-end pull that had been missing the two previous years was finally back in spades. Once on the pipe, the CR was as fast as anything else in the class, and it was very competitive. Really, the only motor issue was its jetting. The new carburetor proved very finicky and difficult to get sorted out. Most people thought the old carburetor was easier to live with, but the power was improved for 2001. Overall, the 2001 machine was a major improvement in performance. Riders loved the return of the old-style power, and it was easily the best CR package since the demise of the steel frame in 1996. Much like 1973, 2002 stands out as a watershed year in Honda motocross history. The 2002 season saw the introduction of an all-new CR250 and the introduction of the machine that would eventually lead to its death, the all-new CR450R four-stroke. The 02 CRF was Honda's first attempt at a four-stroke motocross machine since the XR75 in the early 70s, and a hugely important machine for the brand. While the CR250 would continue to receive minor improvements going forward, the focus of Honda was quickly moving away from this iconic two-stroke racer. While the CR450R was the future, Honda did not neglect the present in 2002. At that point, all of the factory teams were still focused on racing two-strokes, and the CR250R received a complete overhaul that shared most of its chassis improvements with the new 450. The new machine received an all-new frame that marked Honda's third attempt at an alloy chassis, and just as in 2000, the new frame was lighter, slimmer, and less rigid in an attempt to improve handling and chassis feel. In addition to the new frame and bodywork, the O2 machine adopted Honda's first all-new 250 motor design in over a decade. Originally introduced in 1992, the CRV motor had finally been retired and replaced with a radically different design. The new O2 motor ditched the O1's conventional intake in favor of a 125 style case reed and retired the composite racing valve in favor of a work style electronically powered design cribbed from the road racing department. This new RC valve motor was more compact and a full 7 pounds lighter than the 01 design. Dyna reports showed it dusting off the old engine and even besting class leading YZ250 with ease. Unfortunately, however, a dyno curve does not a great motocross engine make. In the real world, the new motor felt lethargic and sleepy. Much like 1988, it was smooth and electric, but it felt slow to the seat of your pants. There was none of that meaty blast of the old engine, just a slow building wave of forward thrust. Once it was on the pipe, it was fast, but it was in no hurry to get there. While the motor left a lot of people cold in 02, the rest of the bike was a surefire winner. It was feather light, it handled very well, and for once it was actually well suspended. Both the spring rates and damping were spot on, and overall it was the best Honda suspension package ever offered in the 250 class. The bike was sleek, sexy, and very competitive, but most riders still preferred the awesome power and overall excellence of Yamaha's YZ250 to the high-tech, but slightly less exciting CR in 02. In 2002, the CR250 received rave reviews for its handling, suspension, fit, feel, and overall engineering. The one area that did not get rave reviews, though, was the all-new motor. The Case Reed RC mill pumped out a slow building and listless delivery that posted great peak numbers on the dyno charts, but garnered very little affection on the track. Even worse, the carburetor was wonky, the work style power valve was constantly going out of adjustment, and the airbox leaked. It was 80% awesome and 20% disappointing. For 2003, Honda tried to punch up the lazy motor delivery on their 250 by opening up the intake and airbox. 
They also redesigned the airbox to have better sealing and installed a new 8-pedal reed valve. Unfortunately, it maintained the same persnickety McCuny carburetor as 2002, but new porting and a redesigned expansion chamber were hopefully going to give the bike a little more aggressive delivery. In addition to the motor upgrades, the chassis got a few changes aimed at improving handling and ergonomics. The swing arm pivot was moved up slightly, and the frame's cross member and head stay were redesigned to increase weight on the front wheel and dial in a bit more flex. To improve ergonomics, the frame's spars were also narrowed slightly, and both the seat and subframe were modified to provide a less cramped riding environment. Lastly, new valving was added to the forks and shock, and paired with stiffer springs to improve suspension performance. Unfortunately, however, those changes didn't add up to a whole lot of real-world improvement. The power continued to be sluggish, unresponsive, and uninspired. The bike was smooth and reasonably fast, but still boring to ride. Jetting continued to be a problem, and what worked one week would not work the next. Once again, the rest of the bike was excellent, but the motor continued to be the weak spot in an otherwise cutting-edge package. For 2004, the CR250 received some fairly minor updates uh, designed at improving performance. There was an all-new reed valve, they also changed the porting slightly, and added a throttle position sensor to the carb. There was also some minor suspension updates, and a larger intake boot with a new seal to improve sealing. In addition to the motor and suspension enhancements, the 250 received some minor component upgrades as well. Now on the track, it was improved slightly, but it didn't really run much different than it did in 2003. It continued to have excellent mid-range and an awesome top-end pull, where it continued to suffer versus the competition was in response. The low end was not very good, and it just lacked the snappy response you would have got on an ORM or a YZ of the time. Even with all the changes to the porting and carburation, the case reed mill continued to be soft off the bottom and slow to respond. Once it was on the pipe, it was plenty fast, but it just wasn't as snappy as the Yamaha. It was certainly competitive, as Ricky Carmichael demonstrated by whipping everybody's tail on the thing, but it was just a little more difficult to ride than some of the better machines in the class. For 2005, Honda made a surprising amount of changes to their 250 power plant. In another attempt to turn the Case Reed Screamer into a torker, Honda dialed up an all-new cylinder for the CR250. For 2005, they introduced an all-new one-piece flapper and redesigned housing for the RC valve. The new cylinder featured revised porting, a reshaped head, and a larger piston to boost bottom and mid-range power. Honda also altered the angle of the intake and narrowed the reed valve for better flow characteristics. In the transmission, Honda updated the fork shaft, shift fork, and shift drum for smoother action. Lastly, a new pipe was stamped that offered an increased volume for beefier low to mid power. On the 250, all these changes added up to an improved but not really different CR250R. Low end power was increased, but it was not enough to write home to Japan about. It picked up better off the bottom and climbed into the power band a bit faster, but it still lacked the quick revving feel of the competition. The mid range, however, continued to be excellent, and the CR ripped once the RC valve opened. On top end, it was decent, but most of the juice was to be found in the mid range. It was still not as responsive as the old CRV mill, but it was closer than at any time since the switch to Case Reed in 2002. As it had been since the O2 redesign, the rest of the bike was excellent. Its handling, suspension, and brakes were all top quality and at or near the top of the class. The previous three years, it had been the motor that was holding this package back, and for 2005, that was improved, but still not enough to put the CR back on top of the 250 division. In 2006, Honda's two-stroke development finally entered the time capsule people have been fearing for half a decade. The CR85R, 125R, and 250R were exactly the same bikes they'd been the year before. For the first time since 1977, the CR250 had no updates whatsoever. There was no reed massaging, case stuffing, or power valve rejiggering in store for the iconic machine that had kicked off Honda's motocross development all those many years before. Even the bold new graphics were not particularly bold. Unfortunately, at this point, Honda had made the decision to go all four strokes, and the two-stroke development was pretty much on the back burner, and knowing that the bike would only make it one more year, Honda wasn't going to invest any more money in its CR250. In 1973, Honda entered the two-stroke motocross market and changed the sport forever. 35 years later, they left that market for good. After more than three decades, the bike that helped kickstart the motocross movement in America was being put out to pasture. The 2007 season would be the last for the CR85, CR85 Expert, CR125, and CR250. All four machines will get one last set of bold new graphics and then ride off in the sunset. The incredible popularity of the four strokes, combined with economic pressures and environmental concerns, led Honda's management to proclaim that the 2007 season would be the last for their two-stroke lineup. Sad news though this was, 
it was easy to understand their reasoning at the time. All four of the big four seemed to be moving in this direction, and Honda appeared to be just the first domino in a chain of events that would see the two-stroke disappear completely from tracks nationwide. Pressure from the EPA, whether perceived or real, a slowing global economy, and the fickle taste of the buying public all seemed to be conspiring to retire the motor that had dominated the sport for more than four decades. Thankfully, today that has not happened. Big thank you to KTM and Yamaha, but in 2007, that really looked like a fait accompli. Today, of course, this machine is remembered fondly, mainly probably due more to the fact that it was the last of its generation, other than the fact that this 02 to 07 was any great motorcycle. The handling, suspension, and what have you was excellent on them, but the motor never quite lived up to the performance of the previous generation. If it had had a more flexible engine, it probably would have been as successful as their four strokes in this time, but the Case Reed motor never quite lived up to its promise. That said, this is still a really fondly remembered motorcycle and uh, certainly one of Honda's most popular for collectors. So there you have it, the history of Honda CR250R, a machine that was certainly retired well before its time. I think Honda Honda never really was embracing the two-strokes to begin with. It was part of their company ethos not to be so involved in the two-strokes. They fought it for a long time, and I think they were clearly happy to get out of it. They always had, you know, when people were making weed eaters and lawnmowers and all the things that were two-stroke, they were all four-stroke from the beginning. So... I think they were happy to have an excuse to get out of building two strokes and they were quick to do it. Super bummed out that they did. I mean, I'm glad that Husqvarna, KTM, Yamaha have continued to embrace the two stroke. I think the CR, you know, if they'd kept developing it, uh, would be a great machine to have now. Two strokes, you know, people need to support them. I love them. They're lighter, they're less expensive, certainly easier to fix. Big fan of CRs, big fan of two strokes in general. And as long as the government doesn't prevent us from burning our Blinzol and our motorcycles, I hope we keep keep selling them, keep riding them. So, like to support this channel. Again, like, comment, share with your friends. I'd appreciate it. Don't want to be a broken record there, but it definitely helps to get the word out. If you want to support what I do, Motocross Vault merch is available. Again, the link is in the description below. Just as an idea, this is the other side of the mask with the, the beast on there, his motorcycle. Love that 92. Um, so if you'd like to check one of these out, it's the link is in the description below. And until we meet again, keep the rubber side down. This is Tony Blazer. Peace.